Amen. Would you turn please to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We're in the middle of Peter's second sermon. Of course, the first one, Acts chapter 2. And as you know, just to catch us up, Peter and John are going into the temple courts, the court of the women in particular, which is sort of a, the inside the main temple enclosure, not the huge 35-acre temple mount, but the few acres that comprise actually the temple itself. Though they can't approach the temple where the priests are, there's a court out in front of it. It's a big rectangular area of uh, the whole temple, and there's a square area out in front of it that's huge. And Jesus did a lot of his ministry there. Peter and John are going in there to pray about three in the afternoon, so it's kind of late in the day. And as they're going through, a man reaches out his hands for alms. And Peter, you know the story, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee. That's the King James version of it, which you've sung so many songs about. And he reaches down and he grabs the man by the hand in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk, pulls the guy to his feet. He's been lame since birth. And he gets up and he's walking and he's leaping and he's praising God. And pretty soon people start realizing something's happened. What has happened? And the crowd begins to gather, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And Peter moves from the area of the beautiful gate probably to the south, where there's a huge colonnade called Solomon's Colonnade. There's questions about whether it was north, south, east, or west with the Temple Mount, but it's a large building to the south that also went by that name. And it's not that they go inside the building. It's meant it's got some inner rooms, but it's a big shady area, and you kind of need that in Jerusalem late in the day. And thousands of people gather and he starts preaching to them. And we've already read big chunks of the sermon, so we're going to review what we did last time, starting in verse 17, which is in the middle of the sermon, where Peter has already done what he did in the last sermon. He has told these guys, you killed him. You killed him. But God loves you. I know I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he did. He says, now brothers, verse 17, I know that you acted in ignorance. We have a whole sermon on that. As, you, as did your leaders. And the leaders were not nice people, many of them. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ, his Messiah, would suffer. Repent then. And remember who he's saying this to. Who's he saying it to? Religious people. Saying repent. And then turn to God. Wait a minute, these are people who are at the temple because they're worshiping God. Now, they've kind of got things a little messed up because their leaders had led them the wrong way. And turn to God so that you may, your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the, the Christ, the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Wait a minute, didn't he send him? Yes. But he's coming back. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Now we're going to stop right there for a minute. First of all, Peter in this sermon is preaching about no less than the second coming of Christ. We often think, oh, that's much later on. I know Jesus talked about it, but then Paul comes in later. No, he's talking about the second coming. In his second recorded sermon, we don't know if he had any other sermons, but he definitely there's two. And here he's saying he had to go back to heaven, but he's coming back. Now, why is he saying this? It's the same reason that we've been saying over and over and over again. Get inside their heads. The people there in Jerusalem, the Jews in general that are religious, there are some Jews that weren't very religious, but the ones that are especially, like the apostles, like the disciples up to this point, were presuming that Jesus was the Messiah, rather, when he revealed himself, was going to rule and reign then and there in the throne of David, kick out the Romans, pick up the sword, and mete out justice, and they were going to have their own nation again. This is what the disciples thought. As you know, 
The disciples over and over again got Jesus wrong. And you can tell how patient Jesus was with his disciples. Even though occasionally you could see him slapping himself on the head saying, how long am I going to have to stay with you? And of course he did that, not because he was fed up with the guys, but they just had the wrong impression. And now the Holy Spirit comes and sorts everything out for Peter and John and the rest of the, the apostles. That he's gone away so that he can come back. Which is why Jesus used over and over again something that you, if you've been coming here for a while, know so well. An illustration of an old Jewish wedding. He kept likening his second coming, his first coming and his second coming to a wedding. Because at the first part of a Jewish marriage, there was a betrothal ceremony where two got legally married to each other, the bride and groom. And they were legally married so that if they wanted to break up, they had to get a divorce, even though they were just betrothed. And then one year later, the actual marriage ceremony happened when the bridegroom came unexpectedly for the bride, usually for the fun part in the middle of the night, and took everybody to his father's house where the feast would go on for seven full days and nights while people who didn't come out of their houses or slept in missed the feast and were outside the gates for those seven days and nights. Wow. You can see what's happening there. So Peter understands this now. Jesus used the same illustration of this marriage over and over and over again. And he didn't get it. Until the Holy Spirit came. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Listen, we are constantly... In this media-saturated world, unlike any other time in the history of the world, not even close to any other time in the history of the world, in this media-saturated world, we are hearing about the Bible and the content of the Bible over and over again from experts. Experts. And so many of the experts aren't even believers. How could that be? Oh, there's lots of them. It's a whole field of study. It's a whole field of study. And even though you have the Bible, and the Bible, as we've said before, doesn't just contain the truth. The Bible is the truth. Once again, I just remind you, it's worth reminding that if the Bible, as some of the experts claim, contains the truth but not is the truth, who is the one to say which parts are true? Anybody can. And some people say, well, the Bible can be to you whatever it wants to be. No, the Bible is what God wants it to be. It's either all the truth or it's not the truth at all. That's the option that God has left with us. Make a choice. It is the truth. Because it is inspired by God. It's holy. It's breathed into the people who wrote this thing down. It is the truth. But more and more, our experts are showing up on our favorite Bible shows that you find on very popular cable and satellite channels. I'll name some of them, okay? History Channel, National Geographic Channel, um, uh, the Discovery Channel, uh, anything by PBS, anything by NPR, um, and so forth and so on. Anything by ABC, CBS, NBC, and all of that, even Fox. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, when they do something on the Bible, and you see a show on the Bible, it's not Christian. Please understand that. And the experts are very impressive. The interviews are great. They have all kinds of letters behind their name. You know, PhD, you know, post hole digger and all of that. So, <laughs> if you have a PhD, I wish I had one too. Okay, so don't get me wrong in that, but there it is. You know, hey, you got all these nut letters behind their name. And yet, and they talk like, you know, the Bible is an amazing book because even though we think Moses was a legend, <gasps> what? Wait a minute, he is from some divinity school. Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, Harvard. 
must be correct. Well, what have I been missing? Nothing. Nothing at all. Because these are people who had decided that Jesus is not who he said he is, and therefore we will interpret the Bible in light of two things. We'll interpret the Bible in light of the idea that God doesn't really talk to people, so Jesus really didn't. And that miracles don't really happen because they are not rational. And we are educated, rational people. We can't talk about miracles because they didn't really happen because they're not rational. This is an entire field of study, which I'm not going to go into any more detail than what I've gone into right now. Because I have a whole seminar on it. We're going to do it sometime in the near future on a Sunday night. Because you need to know it because it is poisoning our world. Our world is drowning in falsehood. Because people who claim to speak the truth, their message is being swallowed hook, line, and sinker by Christians because these people have such, they're on such good, interesting shows on TV. And they have so many credentials behind their name. And they speak with big smiles and what have you. And they're not even believers in Jesus Christ. And I can't tell you how many times... Over the last 30 years, people have come up to me and said, you know what I learned? What? There were two, maybe three Isaiahs. Did you know that? Where did you get that? I heard it on TV. <laughs> or, hey, I've heard how various miracles in the Bible really took place. For instance, you know the feeding of the 5,000? Yes, it really wasn't a miracle. It wasn't. Feeding 5,000 plus their families? Yeah, no. No, the little kid comes up and he's got the five loaves and the two fish and he presents it to Jesus and everybody is so moved. Oh, that they all, of course, they have those big puffy sleeves in their robes and they're all tied up with string there and they open the string. Of course, they keep their lunches in there and everybody shares their food. And oh, there were all these 12 basketfuls of food left over. It really wasn't a miracle. Really? Yeah, because God doesn't do miracles, does he? It's not rational. You're, and we're hearing this too. You're a fool if you believe that. You're an idiot if you believe that. The latest one, I love this one. You're a science denier. And you're going to hear a lot more about that coming straight at you. And it's meant to humiliate Christians into denying the things of God, especially his miracles and his voice. It's an attempt at secularizing faith because the world does say there are merits in here that are okay. And they're good and good things to live by. But don't tell me about heaven or hell and don't you dare call me a sinner because I can sin any way I want to and it's not even a sin. So here are Peter and John and they're telling these guys who had assumed the Messiah because their leaders had told them that the Messiah was going to take up the sword and drive out the Romans. Even though all the prophecies of the Old Testament about Jesus, which were so numerous, many of those prophecies spoke of him being a suffering servant. The big one, of course, Isaiah 52 and 53, Psalm 22 and other Psalms, that he was a suffering servant. He was going to die, but he was going to rise, and then he was going to come and rule and reign another time. That's the book of Ezekiel. Come on. Stick with the Bible. Always stick with the Bible. I'm not going to tell you what shows to watch or not watch. Filter them through this and find out if you should be. But be aware that Satan, who is the God, small g, of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the father of all lies, is trying to feed not just the world, but the church half truths and whole lies about the scripture in a way that we can easily swallow them. And I got news for you. We do. And we do on a vast scale because once again, it's very, very easy to put together a very slick Bible program that is entirely secular and the Christians can't tell the difference. Mainly because they don't know the word. Or if they do know the word, they bring up questions where they go, well, I didn't know there were three Isaiahs. I didn't know that Moses might have been a legend. I didn't know that maybe the Exodus wasn't really real. Maybe that miracle 
of the fire and the cloud by day and the fire by night was actually an Arabian oil fire <laughs> that came and went. You think that sounds stupid? James Cameron, the director of Titanic and Avatar and Terminator and all of those things, made a video that preaches just that, to destroy people's faith. He's an atheist. And you know how many Christians have swallowed it? I don't. I fear for it, though. God is the God of miracles. And his word is true, and he speaks to us to this moment and will continue through this book and by his Holy Spirit and reveals the Father through the Son who is revealed in this book and by the Holy Spirit. And he is true. He is true. Be warned. And here's what Peter is cleaning up, the mess that he used to be in. Because once again, his leaders told him over and over again, some good guys among them, by the way, but very badly mistaken. They were so nationalistic as Jews that the ones that didn't cooperate with the Romans wanted to kill the Romans. And they had taught the Messiah, when he comes, will raise an army that will miraculously destroy the Romans. And the people believed it because they liked that idea. The people that didn't preach it were a group of people we're going to look at in a little while called the Sadducees. The Sadducees ran the Temple Mount. And they believed in God. And they believed in his law. But they didn't believe in angels, the Holy Spirit, or an afterlife, either heaven or hell. They were secularists, and it didn't matter who they went with, and they decided, let's go with the strongest, and they went with the Romans. So they didn't make waves for the Romans, but everybody else did. And here Peter is saying, Jesus didn't come to do that, and I get that now. And he went away to heaven, but he must come back, and he most assuredly will. Now, I'm going to make a few more comments. This is kind of like a prophecy update, except without all the current events. Because we need to understand that any prophecy updates that we get when we discuss about the end of the world, they have to be within a particular framework that the Scripture lays out. There are a lot of questions, and it's very easy to doubt nowadays, will Jesus really ever come back? He left a couple of thousand years ago, and he isn't back yet. Elton John mocks all of that in one of his albums. He isn't back yet. Ah, he's not coming back. The world goes on as it always have. Peter even comments on that. Some people say that everything just goes on as it always has. Those of you that like big words, they call that uniformitarianism. Blah. I hate using big words like that on Sunday mornings. I mean, it's almost defiling the place. But everything's just always the same. Nothing changes. And therefore, Jesus' return, according to the cults, must have been spiritual. Jesus' return, according to certain forms of early Christianity that's even carried over into some forms of today's Christianity, must have been spiritual, must have been an idea about an earthly kingdom that we can contribute to and set up. They call it kingdom now theology. But he hasn't come back and, eh, Probably won't. What's fascinating to me is this is where, and you, you, some of you love it, some of you can't stand it, but bear with me on it. This is where a little study of Christian history comes in. Actually, Christian history is important. And when you look at it, you find that the first handwritten accounts of the early Christians, a hundred years after Jesus, 200 years after Jesus, 300 years after Jesus, lived in the imminent expectation of his immediate return. If they did, so should we. And they were close. They were close, close in time to him, 
Some of these people had heard directly from the apostles in the earliest forms, and they were waiting for the Lord to come. People say, well, the end of the world really was prophesied. It was the fall of the temple and, and the end of uh, John as an apostle of Christ, the emperor Domitian. He was really the Antichrist and all of that. Then why is it that a half a century later, the Christians are saying, Jesus is coming back. Be ready. Did they miss something? The Jews who were Christians were saying, Jesus is coming back. Be ready. Did they miss something? Their temple got destroyed. The Jews got exiled. Come on. Jesus is coming back. And you read the descriptions that you have in the Bible, and then you look at <laughs> history, not just church history, and you realize the world has been a terrible mess throughout history. What's changed? We have a better way of reporting the mess. So the mess seems bigger. But you see, the way that the mess is being reported, the mess that the world is in, all the different descriptions you can read in the Bible of the terrible way things will be in the end times, we can't say it's always been that way. It's increasing like never before. Because with the things like the internet and Facebook and all kinds of stuff out there, the news sources that are now able to go instantaneously all over the world, and the propensity to propaganda here in our own nation and in nations all around the world because now you can so easily bend the truth or change it that we can say the world is a horrible place and it's getting worse. But Jesus said it would. And what we're finding is that all the descriptions of how the world will begin to wrap itself up prophetically are now increasing exponentially because the information that causes people to rebel against God, back to what we started saying today, get the wrong idea about God, reject God, doubt God, walk away from God. Now the red carpet's been rolled down on that, and the world has never been like that, ever. I just want to encourage you, before we move out of this subject into what happens next, because Peter's on it, we're on it. Jesus left. Don't doubt for a minute he'll be back. When is he coming back? Oh man, don't follow anyone who ever picks a date. As somebody once said, how wide is a lightning bolt? Don't get too close to that person because they're going to draw God's displeasure. When Jesus said, no one knows, not even me, if somebody says, I figured it out, they're saying, I know more than Jesus. And that's blasphemous, at least. You know this, we say this often, just to make sure, because there's so many of these wackos out there. And some of them are even credible to a certain extent. But Jesus is coming back. And we don't know the day. But he did give us the times. And as Bob is teaching on Wednesday night, you need to go to that study. Just like it was in the days of Noah. That's the way it is in the end times. Well, what's that like? People are marrying and giving in marriage and doing what they usually do. What's different? Not much, except the heart. With a complete rebellion against God and not caring about his word or his laws. Not caring about his salvation or his love. And that's when he'll come back. And that's why it'll be like a thief in the night. That's why it'll be like a bridegroom in the middle of the night for his bride. Because people are going to stop looking. That's when we need to make sure we're staying busy with the things of God. And our gaze is upward. Be about the Lord's business. We don't sit and wait. Boy, I'll tell you, the Jesus movement, when I got back with the Lord, way back in the 70s, I started attending Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, while it was still in the legendary tent that it was in. And man, they had altar calls that brought anywhere from two to 500 people down every single time they got up there and preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And a lot of people that I know 
ran up credit card debt. And some even quit their jobs and waited. The Bible even says, don't stop serving the Lord. Don't quit and sit around. One of the letters, one of the epistles that Paul writes says, you guys get off your rusty dusties, as my pastor used to say, and start serving Jesus. You don't know when he's going to be back. He could be back right now. <laughs> or he could be back in a thousand years, but I don't think so. But he said, in the meantime, you'd be about his business. So here's Peter. And he's telling the guys, Jesus had to go away. They're not thinking that. This is a revelation to them. But he points it out, it's from the scriptures. It's from the prophecies. And we've gone through this already, so we're not going to revisit that part again. But I wanted to emphasize this. The Lord is coming back. Don't get lazy. Spiritually or otherwise, we don't have time for that. He never gave us time for that. He said, the hour is urgent now, but he didn't come back yesterday. It doesn't matter. Today's a new day. What if it's today? And he keeps us on the edge of our seats on purpose so we don't get lazy. So he says, repent, verse 19, and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing from the Lord, and that, uh, that times may come, for, of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. There will be a return, and when he does, he calls it times of refreshing. You know how nasty the world is right now, and where it's going, and it's just, oh man, I wish oh, things change, please. When he comes, times of refreshing. It's like you've just walked a long, hot journey through the desert and you arrive at your destination and there's green grass and waterfalls and somebody comes up and hands you a cup of ice water. Welcome to the millennium. And it's going to be so much better than something like that. When he comes back, he sets everything right for a thousand years. The Jews knew this. And they were expecting it. They were expecting a very limited version of it when the Messiah would come and throw out the Romans and rule on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And yes, it'll be great, but it'll only be right here. They weren't thinking big enough. God is God. Jesus is God. He doesn't have to deal with a small area like back there, ancient Judea. This is for the world. This is the globe. This is the whole thing. And we're just one small blip in all the universe, but we're the one where he came to die. And died for our sins and rose again and lives for us. It's amazing for us. And one day he's going to set everything right because he's not just coming back to come back. He's coming back to rule and reign. And it will happen someday. And when it does, it will all be perfect. Verse 22. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to him, to everything he tells you. You must listen to everything he tells you. Sorry, a little hard time reading here. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. A prophet like Moses, Peter is saying, you know that the Messiah was going to be like Moses. Moses said so back in Deuteronomy 19. He told us that. You guys knew this, he's saying. A prophet like Moses. Well, how like Moses? Well, remember, he's preaching to Jews. Who is the most important person to this group of Jews there on the Temple Mount? It's real obvious. Moses. Moses is the man. Well, we can say Abraham is the most important Jew who ever lived because it was the first one. He was the first Hebrew. 
And because it all started with him. Well, it started before, but that's where the covenants began to get made. But when it came to Moses, it gave them the law, the feasts, the sacrifices, the procedures. And they're on the temple where all that stuff's supposed to take place. To Moses, it's really important to them. And Peter goes for the throat. You know that Moses even said, Moses said there's going to be a prophet like me who's going to arise and you need to do everything he says. Wow. By the way, Peter's telling them, that was Jesus. Now do what he says. Well, first of all, how was Jesus like Moses? Huh. Well, Moses gave people by, it's all by God, of course. We're going to, I'm just going to use Moses, but Moses by God, by the, by the Lord, gave the people as they wandered in the wilderness bread, right? Yeah, manna, six days out of seven. And remember the Sabbath, he didn't give any, but the, what they got on the sixth day would carry over to the seventh. It was the only time it would do that. That was a miracle, otherwise it rotted. Manna, that what they called bread from heaven. And it sustained the people in the wilderness for how many years? Forty years God gave them this. It was miraculous. What does Jesus do? Yeah, up in Galilee, feeds people bread. Barley loaf, by the way, breaks that thing, multiplies it, feeds 5,000 people plus their wives and children. Another time, 4,000 people plus their wives and children. He was like Moses. He fed the people up uh, sort of on the sides of the, of the hill of the Golan Heights. It you know, leads up to the plateau just above a city called Bethsaida. Yeah, I know you didn't want to know that, but I'm telling you anyway. But he feeds people in the wilderness with bread. Great. Okay, so he does that. He's like Moses. Wait a minute. Moses was a prophet. He even says so right here. He is a prophet. Stephen uses this. When we get to chapter 7, you'll hear this again. Stephen goes after the whole Sanhedrin, preaching to them like Peter did, except Stephen is preaching for his life because they're going to kill him. And so he lets him have it. He brings it up again. Moses was a prophet, and he said, there's a guy coming like me. You need to do everything he says. Well, how well did the people do everything Moses said? <laughs> <laughs> they rebelled stiff necked people how long am I going to have to be among you must I strike this rock a second time Moses was frustrated and the whole story of the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness was one of following God and then a departure then a judgment then a punishment a miracle back they go with God and it cycles again and again and again and here Peter says one like Moses was going to come, and you're to do everything he said. Moses said so about that. Moses was a prophet. He spoke for God. Jesus spoke for his Father. I say whatever the Father tells me to say. It doesn't get more prophetic than that. What is a prophet? Someone who speaks for God. What is a false prophet? Someone who claims to speak for God. And they're speaking for themselves. A prophet is someone who gets it right 100% of the time. Not 99.999% of the time. 100% of the time. How do you know if you've got a real prophet on your hand? They're always right. And what they say matches the scripture. How do you test a prophet? Well, it matches the scripture. And if, it's, if the prophet is predictive, then it will come to pass. And maybe not in the next five minutes and maybe not in your lifetime. But it will be found true. Jesus, like Moses, could be called very easily the ultimate prophet because he never said anything wrong and he always said what his father told him to say. That is the greatest prophet who ever lived. Moses, listen to this. How is Jesus like Moses? Peter says he was. Moses said he's coming. He came. How was he like this? Moses instituted the temple sacrifices. They had a tabernacle at the time, basically a tent temple, a portable temple. Same thing. It's, we'll call it the temple, even though it was tabernacle. The temple has fewer syllables, you see. It's easier to say. <laughs> but Moses instituted the sacrifices. Jesus was the sacrifice. He fulfilled 
all the sacrifices when he died on the cross. He fulfilled them. Moses instituted the Israel's religious feasts. Their high holy days. Uh, we're right up on one already, Sukkot. It's Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. We're not talking about that today in any, any one particular. But Moses instituted the feasts. And every one of them points to Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled already four of them. Well, then he didn't fulfill the other three? No, that's coming. <laughs> that's yet to come. The Feast of Trumpets, which just happened this last week. The Feast of Yom Kippur, which is the Feast of Atonement. And that's a judgment, by the way. We think of, oh, well, our sins were already atoned for. No, this is, an, this is a feast concerning judgment of sin. Wow. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the one we're coming up on. Those two actually we're coming up on. And the Feast of Tabernacles is the one feast only that will still be celebrated in that thousand-year reign of Christ, that time of refreshing, even by non-Jews, by Gentiles. Jesus fulfilled the feasts, or he will. And every one of them, when you look at it, points back to him. If you have any Messianic friends, people that are Jews but who are Christians, they will tell you, oh yeah, we still do the feasts as Jews and we celebrate Jesus because that feast, Passover, speaks of Jesus, the Lamb of God. That feast, uh, Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit that speaks of Jesus again. I'd go on and on and on and they can give you all the little uh, nuances of all of it. It's fantastic. Like Moses, Moses instituted the feast. Jesus comes along and fulfills them. A prophet like Moses. A prophet like me, Moses said. Moses inst instituted the priestly order. He set that up. God told him how to do it. Wrote it down. Here's where the priest comes from. Guess what? Jesus is the permanent and forever great high priest. Representing us before God. Moses instituted the tabernacle. Once again, that tent temple that they moved around with them when they moved from place to place. If you know anything about the tabernacle, and it's a whole study unto itself, it's a great Bible study. The tabernacle, when you go through all the different descriptions about how the tabernacle was to be built, the materials that it was made out of, the colors of the materials, the only thing you can conclude, which Paul concluded for us, is that it's a model of heaven. Heaven isn't the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a model of heaven so that the people could picture the nuances of heaven and God ruling in heaven. Jesus returned to heaven. Moses gave us a picture. Jesus says, I'm from there and I'm going back there. Hmm. Oh, it gets better. Moses built the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. You guys all know what it looked like. You saw Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> Ark of the Covenant. Here's the deal. The Ark of the Covenant was the holiest object of the Jews. It represented the presence of God with the people, and God actually put his presence there. It did? Yeah. Don't touch the Ark. Why? You die. Why? Because God is holy. Yeah, and you're not. You'll die. That's why they had to carry the ark with a couple of poles through the rings on the side, pick it up and carry it. Don't touch the thing. Don't do it. The ark of the covenant was a gold box that was about that wide, about that high, about equally as deep, and it had, it was wood, acacia wood, overlaid with gold. So it was made out of wood, but it had gold over the top, like gold leaf. But the lid was solid gold. And on top of the lid, you had two cherubim. Those are mighty angels. These are the angels with wings. Not all angels have wings, apparently. When we get to heaven, we'll 
let God sort that out for us. But you've got these two mighty angels on the lid that are bowing down towards one little area right above the, the actual surface of the lid and they're bowing down into this area with their faces down and their wings are arcing up over their backs and touching in the middle. Can you picture it? And it's solid gold. And the area that is right there on the surface of the lid is what you've heard of before known as the mercy seat. And once a year, the high priest of the people during the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is coming up in Israel real soon, they don't have the temple anymore, they don't have the, the tabernacle, they don't have the, the Ark of the Covenant, they just reflect on their sins. But once a year when this was around, the high priest would go in, in very plain clothes. He normally wore fantastic robes, but this time he's just clothed like a peasant. Ah, oh, very interesting. And he sprinkles the blood of a sacrifice on that surface. Okay? The mercy seat. Why? Because the presence of God hovered, as it were, above that surface. What did that look like? What was it like? I have no idea. I wasn't there to see it, but it was there because he was there. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that inside that box were three things. One thing was Aaron's staff. He had a staff, like a shepherd's staff, except it was just a stick. They did all the miracles with it. Remember Moses? You saw the movie on that one too, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, turn a staff into a snake. That rod. And it was, Moses, it was challenged at one point. Well, who are you to tell us that you have the words of God? Who are you to tell us this is really God speaking? Somebody else wants to do it. I want to do it. God says, put your rods out there, you shepherds of the people. The one that buds, that's the one with the authority. And Aaron's rod which was dead wood, came back to life. It budded. It even flowered. And then the ground opened up and swallowed the other guys, so they were done. <laughs> but they took this rod, and that's the authority of God. And they put it in a box. That's God's authority. Something else, God's provision. Manna. So they went out and gathered up some manna. They stuck it in a jar. When you say a jar, think pottery, or maybe it was gold. I don't know. It's probably a pretty nice jar, probably gold, something else. And they put a jar of manna inside the box. God provides, and it's a miracle every time. And the last thing that was in there was the Ten Commandments, or the law of God, on the tablets of stone. The law of God is not just how we live. Go through the book of Romans, and very early in the book of Romans, you find the law of God is unattainable perfectly by people. We will break it. We will break it eventually. We will break it early. We will break that law. And the law is a judge to us, so to speak. It tells every person who was ever born, ever will be born, Every person that is living now, you broke this. You're a sinner. Therefore, God has to atone for your sins because you can't. How so? Very confusing thing. It's, it's, it's because it's a very simple statement. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says the soul that sins will surely die. And it's not just talking about physical death. That's part of it, but that part we already know. But the soul that sins will surely die. This is everlasting punishment. How do you atone for that? Well, if the punishment for sin, listen to me because we're almost done. The pun if the punishment for sin is death, to atone for your sin, you need to die for your sin. But if you die for your sin, listen, thinking caps on, get your coffee in a minute. If you die for your own sin, you die in your 
own sin and you become a victim of it and you burn in hell. See the problem? It's a catch-22. If the wages of sin is death, and the only way that, that, that there is perfect justice for sin is that I, I have to die for my own sin. If I die for my own sin, I die a sinner. And then I got a problem. I haven't atoned for my sin. I'm dead, and I haven't atoned for my sin because I died trying to. That's a problem. It's a catch-22. How do we get out? God gave Moses this procedure. And individually, they can offer sin offerings. Corporately at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they offer the one sin offering for all the people so that the blood of a sacrificed animal is sprinkled on what's called the mercy seat. Why? Listen, there's a very, very simple, cool reason for it. It's sprinkled on the lid of the box. Why? The blood of the sacrificed goat goes between God's holiness and the law that kills. And it's the barrier between the two. Now you know why Jesus had to shed his blood. Because his blood came between the law which killed every one of us because we sinned and the law is perfect. And we're not. And the holiness of God. How in the world can you even pray if God is holy and I'm not, Jesus shed his blood on that cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sins so that God made us holy. Say, I'm not such a very holy person. Did you see what I did this morning? I sure hope not. <laughs> well, wait a minute. See, he atoned for how many of our sins? All. Yeah, you got it. And how much is all? Oh. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't repent because I do several times a day. I blow it. I think the wrong thoughts. I say the wrong thing. I get the wrong idea. I do stupid stuff. So do you. And we do this. But he has washed away how many of our sins? Oh. And we can depend on that so that we can commune with Jesus' Father. That's why he did it. And we can do that today. Don't presume upon God to go to him, you know, full of sin, like, yeah, he'll, you know, he'll accept me. And we sang that song, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance, O Lord, knowing that you love us no matter what we do. Yes, but the operative word in the song is repentance. Leads us to repentance. I turn from my sin. If I regarded sin in my heart, David said, you wouldn't have heard my prayer. In other words, I'm hanging on to it. I'm right. God, you're wrong. I, I sin, but I like that sin, so I'm going to keep it. God says, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. <coughs> Especially today, in this time where now we are the church, and it's the New Testament times. But there's one last thing. You find that the Ark of the Covenant disappeared sometime after the time of Hezekiah. That gold box with the gold lid with the Aaron's rod and the jar of manna and the law. It disappeared sometime after the time of Hezekiah. Nobody knows exactly when, and nobody knows where it went. It was hidden, probably because Jerusalem might have been being attacked or laid siege to, and some priests took it and hid it so that it wouldn't fall into enemy hands, and then they died, and they lost where it was. It's just gone. Maybe somebody did get their hands on it and destroyed it. It's possible. We don't know. Which means that Herod's temple, Herod's temple had no Ark of the Covenant in it. They just, I don't know what they did because there's not really any record of it that I've been able to find. Somebody might know. Where did they sprinkle that blood on the Day of Atonement? Probably on the altar. But there wasn't an Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies of Herod's temple, which is the temple at the time of Jesus. Very interesting. Because it wasn't there. It was gone. But wait. It shows up again. You find it in the book of Revelation, where John says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's Covenant. And he sees it in heaven. Now wait a second. You say, So what are you saying? Did this wooden box overlaid with gold that has the gold lid and all the stuff in it, did God just sort of translate it into heaven? 
Did he just sort of, you know, rapture it up there and now it's in heaven? No, you missed the point. You see, Moses said, there will come a prophet like me. Do everything he says. Do whatever he says. And Peter brings this out. And Stephen brings it out. Because the people were referred to Moses. How was he like this? The Ark of the Covenant was wood overlaid with gold. In the Hebrew brain, substances, numbers, things were used as teaching tools to teach the Hebrews very simple concepts. And they kept it simple. Acacia wood, what did that mean to them? Being human. Gold, what did that mean to them? God. Divinity. God. Gold meant God. You have wood, humanity, overlaid with gold, God. The lid, the crown of the box, solid gold. No humanity. Solid gold, all God. On the box, on top of it, the presence of holy God right above the lid. The mercy seat, the place where we receive mercy because the blood of the sacrifice is sprinkled there and it atones for sin, that blood. And inside the box, you have the unbroken law of God. You have the jar of manna, the bread from heaven. And you have Aaron's rod, the authority of God. The ark of the covenant is Jesus. The box that they had in the tabernacle and the temple was a box. But who was it always pointing to? Jesus. And when you see heaven open in the book of Revelation and John sees the Ark of the Covenant there, who's he seeing? It's just Jesus. There he is. Do everything he said. Or, as Peter finishes... If you don't, even as Moses said, that anyone, verse 23, who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Ooh. This is turn or burn. This is not a sliding scale in which to get into heaven. Like what Moses said, the laws were severe, and that one was really severe. Do everything he says or be completely cut off. And it happened. It happened several times to people in the camp of Israel. Why was God so severe? Because God is pointing to Jesus. If you take him, you have eternal life. You're part of the camp of God's people forever. And if you reject him, you are out forever. But there is no sliding scale. There are no, no gray areas in any of this. It's a warning to everyone that could translate into eternal exile and punishment to all who don't listen to Jesus. That was the deal. Spiritually, the application is obvious. To the Jews, it was another matter altogether. And they saw it. They rejected God, so God destroyed his temple. But he also did that to make sure that people would say there's only one other place to look for atonement because the temple's not there anymore. It's either look to Jesus or make up your own theology. And unfortunately, religious Jews from about 200 AD began to make up their own theology because the temple was gone. Now what do we do with our sins? And that is a huge problem to the Jewish people who are religious. Huge problem. Where does that leave us this morning? Well, <laughs> with more to go on a sermon for sure. But Peter tells them plainly, Jesus was the one who Moses was talking about. And Jesus fulfilled everything that Moses told the people to do. You want to know what the Messiah is? who he is, where he is, it couldn't be more obvious. You're Jewish. Look at Moses. It couldn't be more obvious. And reject it at your own risk. 
And remember, all of the things associated with Moses only pointed one way. Jesus. Which brings us back to the very simple punchline that we had here three weeks ago. Peter's message was always completely and only about one thing. Jesus. Even in Moses. Jesus. Even in his laws. Jesus. Even in the tabernacle, the priesthood, and the Ark of the Covenant especially. God has been preaching Jesus all along. And here, it's brought back to us today in the words of Peter. And I really like that. What do you do with all of this? I don't know. But love Jesus and worship him because God has made it very, very clear through the scriptures that this is true. It is the truth. Hold on to it. Preach it. Live it. Love one another. Because that same Jesus who went into heaven is coming back soon too. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for this morning. For the simple little message, but a real eye-opener. Lord, do with it as you would in our lives. Because it's your Holy Spirit who transforms us. And we want to be more like you, Lord. Those are real easy words to say. When you tell us what we need to do. And you tell us what you will do. Sometimes we fear the pain. We fear the cost. Lord, there is nothing like being like you. There is no cost too great to pay for being like you. There is no obedience too stern. That should prevent us from wanting to be like you and let you have your way in our lives. I pray that you would for all of us, that we on this divide would be a shining light, bright light wherever we go, your holy people wherever we put our foot, perhaps opposed, perhaps welcomed, but always blessed, that we would be as you, O oh Lord, here, now, and until you come, loving you, blessing and serving others, being about your business, our Father in heaven, until you send your Son. Thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen.